Good morning, Ailey, and welcome back to the Low Carb Video Show. Thank you so much for having me. It's our pleasure to see you again. Uh, good morning, Monsieur Marc. Good morning. I trust you are both wonderfully well. Breathing and alive and here to, here to educate, so I consider that yeah. pretty lucky. Excellent. Yep. Living the life in Austin for me. So, Ellie, thank you for coming back on our show to talk about your COVID-19 experience. Could you give us a quick reminder of, uh, about you and your background? Sure. Um, so I'm a, a rheumatologist by training, uh, internal medicine and rheumatology. So that's autoimmune diseases like lupus and rheumatoid um, and MS and a variety of autoimmune, but, uh, you know, joint related diseases. I uh, went on to study integrative medicine with Dr. Andrew Weil and his colleagues. So uh, integrative medicine is is kind of a, many people think of it as a holistic approach to medicine where you're incorporating uh, into conventional Western medicine, things like uh, sl sleep training and sleep hygiene or stress management, understanding uh, food chemicals and nutrition and diet and how that all interplays with um, conventional Western uh, modalities for, for health issues. And then environmental health came a little bit later and that's how the environment affects human health. So air quality and air pollution, uh, food chemicals, water contaminants, personal care products, furniture chemicals. And so I combine all of that, um, seems odd, but I combine it all into how all of them interplay into human health. Um, and that's, you know, I'd love to share my experience and, and really what COVID, how COVID-19 plays into environmental health, especially. Cool, cool. So what has been your experience so far with COVID-19, is there a still a confinement in, you know, where you are? So I'm in central New Jersey and we got really, I mean, I'm sure most of your listeners are aware of sort of where this is washing over the world. We, we were hit pretty hard in, uh, in March um, and April. And, uh, and in fact, New York City, which is only a stone's throw away from where I live, was so heavily hit. Um, I trained in New York, so it happens to be really close to my heart, all of those hospital institutions. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're sort of coming out of it. I, I always get nervous to say that because um, once we loosen our, our guard or lower our guard, we start to get a little um, uh, not cautious enough, I believe, and we stop wearing masks and we start to, you know, not social distance. New Jersey actually, as of today, is the second week um, – where they've had a decrease in COVID cases, which is pretty unusual. Um, not too many states at this moment right now um, are on that trend. So um, by the time this airs, you know, we could have an entirely different picture because that's what COVID is doing and that's what we're doing with COVID. So, um, you know, so we'll, we take one day at a time and, uh, and try to give good information. I try to give really healthful information on how to not only prevent getting the disease, uh, the infection, but also, um, you know, how to manage when you do have it. So, uh, and, and what do you do post COVID? There's going to be literally millions of post COVID, um, you know, recovered patients. And yes. there are a lot of uh, new information coming down about post COVID syndromes um, and what that may entail moving forward. So we have a whole spectrum of learning um, that's going on right now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, we'll talk some more about this. Uh, right now, it uh, seems to be hitting the southern states. So, uh, Texas is involved and Florida and, yeah. you know, California still. Um, but, I don't know. I, I just had this feeling that uh, it's, some of it is fabricated. Uh, you know, they move from actual actual cases to cases based on testing, which of course is going to be higher because of uh, there's more and more testing being done. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, you know, <clears throat> the CDC recently admitted that uh, the tests are not very accurate, so it's very difficult to figure out uh, who, who to believe and what to believe that, you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a skeptic by nature, so um, I'm taking all of this information with a grain of salt, 
And, uh, <clears throat> it, you know, as far as the, the, the mask, um, you know, I've been playing petanque with my buddies for the past two months, and uh, we don't wear a mask, and, you know, we, we don't hug or anything, but uh, none of us has gotten anything. So uh, I don't know if we are a particular part of the population, but I have a feeling that a lot of it has to do with um, control and, you know, uh, manipulating people into fear. And I don't like that feeling. I don't like that feeling at all. But that's just my, my point of view. Yeah, and you're, you're certainly entitled to your opinion. I, I would say, um, you know, I, I'm, I fall very closely to the science. And um, no matter whether, you know, people could argue about who's, who's shelling out the science. But I will tell you that um, having, having met and worked with Dr. Fauci many years ago, understanding um, epidemiology and, and public health as it stands and what we have available, I would argue that the numbers are, are a little bit scary. They, they shut people down from doing sometimes better be, behavior in the sense of the masking. Um, we know that there's data to support masks because it does actually decrease the amount of um, particulate air that comes out of people's mouths. There are other ways to protect yourself. As I was talking with Mark earlier that um, I wear a face shield um, because it's just a clear plastic. It goes about three inches below the, the level of the chin and it's incredibly comfortable and you can see me smile and there's human interaction that's possible. Um, but it also protects me from droplets of air from people going by me. And, um, you know, I think I, one example is I went walking with a friend and we both had our face shields on and there are people biking and running right next to us on a bike path. Um, and I could feel the gust of their exhalation coming right at us as they were going by. And there was literally no way to prevent, had I not had a face shield, breathing in whatever they were breathing out. Now, we do know that there's asymptomatic spread. And so to say maybe that one person does or does not have it, um, I think it's really, it's really a hard thing to, uh, you should always just pretend and believe that every single person around you has it until proven otherwise. The right, well, I, I, you know, I have to step in because uh, this whole setup negates the immune system and that's just not right. You know, we need to build, we need to start with a strong immune system, we need to reinforce it and we also need to uh, we should actually emphasize helping people understand that there are ways to protect themselves besides putting a, a mask on your face. Because your shield is all nice, but it doesn't protect you from anything coming from the bottom. I mean, to to pretend or to claim that the, the virus is going to hit you straight on and not coming through the bottom because it's not a full face with the uh, with the filters it's not a gas mask or anything so the i feel the mask and and even the shield are just a kind of a emotional um a way to make people feel better about uh, the environment but you said yourself you when you uh, you feel people running by or <clears throat> or cycling by if you can feel their breath or you know exhalation some of it has got to come out from the bottom of your face shield. So all of this yeah. is, um, you know, to me, it strikes me as silly. I mean, out of respect, I will wear the mask inside a business or inside a, you know, and I ask permission to people inside if it's okay to take it off as long as I stay six feet away. But then again, who says that the, the, the virus is going to stop at six feet and not seven feet or nine feet or ten feet? I mean, this, all of this is uh, highly, you know, questionable in my opinion. Well, I, I think that your concerns and, and what you're discussing is, is valid. Um, but I would also argue that having been on the front lines and seeing the types of people that come through an emergency room, um, also managing them now as an outpatient, um, it's real. And it's not always the, the sickest. I mean, well, let's go into that because I do want to give your audience really reasonable information 
Um, and you mentioned the immune system. Absolutely. We really, we, it's not just solving this problem through masking or entirely through social distancing. I mean, that's the immediate type of action we can take. But what, what takes a little longer to, to build in people's minds is the fact that our immune systems are, are built to survive as, you know, quite a bunch of insults, including infectious disease through millennia. And that the, the closer we get to feeding our bodies clean food, less pesticides, more nutrient value foods, um, many of which, by the way, are being used to, tr to treat, a, you know, as a therapeutic for COVID infection, uh, such as high dose vitamin D and high dose vitamin C and quercetin and vitamin B2. Um, these are now being looked at as remedies in addition to medications. So there's something to the fact that human beings need to actually get these type of nutrients uh, on a regular basis um, throughout their lives, even pre, you know, in, in utero. So, um, you know, what we now know is that anyone can get infected. I mean, anyone can get infected. The question is who's going to fare worse once they are infected. Um, and that's really the million dollar question, because if we know who is the person who would get a worse response, inflammatory response, that's where we want to hone in. And we do know some information about that. We know that comorbidities and people with chronic illnesses, such as obesity, heart disease, hypertension, um, autoimmune right. diseases, they fare worse once yeah, well. infected. Yeah, because the immune system is already weak, weakened by the sickness, and and so. But the problem is when someone is um, affected by the virus and they die because the original sickness, the you know whatever it is, the diabetes, the cancer, the, the heart disease, and everything, they blame it on COVID, not on the the actual disease, and which is to me it's lying. You know, uh, uh, they could catch the flu and die the same way. But yet they're not going to blame the flu for it. Well, so, uh, I think you're, you're right that the underlying disease needs to be managed. There are people with only one comorbidity, such as high blood pressure, that, uh, you know, six in 10 Americans um, walk around with at least one comorbidity. So, uh, you know, the people that are otherwise healthy but have high blood pressure, um, you know, they aren't necessarily going to die with the flu. They're going to, you know, there may be some heightened inflammatory response that, the virulence, the virulence of COVID is different than other types of viruses. And I think that has to be considered because this is a much more virulent and much more infectious uh, entity than, than, the, than H influenza. And we know this because we have many more deaths now from uh, the virus in a six month period than we do even in an eight month period of H influenza. So, um, you know, there's, there's something to the actual characteristics of this virus. It's easily contracted, easily spread, and it actually causes a heightened immune response. Um, and specifically, we now know to specific, you know, uh, receptors, particularly of the lungs. It's, it's, pri it's primarily a respiratory condition, uh, but it also has issues with blood clotting, and it also has issues with stroke. Um, we now see it in children as a hyperinflammatory response in otherwise healthy children. So that doesn't explain why they're getting affected and also doing um, worse in small populations. So there's a lot we don't know. And I think um, the one things we do know is that being uh, an ill person going into an infection like COVID is the worst case scenario, given that we know people are baseline inflamed from their comorbidities, be it obesity, heart disease, um, even medications that they're taking. For instance, diabetics, uncontrolled glucose leads to worse outcomes with COVID, but also the medications such as metformin is a very common medication um, that actually lowers vitamin B12 in people who use it chronically. And so you're talking about a nutrient deficiency from a medication used to treat the comorbidity and that actually kind of piles on for an elevated inflammatory response when an insult comes in, such as uh, the coronavirus. Um, right. So we should right. all be working, you know, to kind of get healthier as, as you do every day and, and all the work you're doing with your cooking and, and, and your, uh, your podcast. Well, my nutrition too. I'm a nutritionist yeah. as well. Yeah. So what upsets me is uh, why are the 
uh, health experts, quote unquote, because um, I have an issue with them. Uh, why don't they recommend prevention and protection instead of telling us to cover up and wait for a miracle vaccine that will be untested and potentially forced onto people? I have a problem with that. We, we need to educate people to protect their health through vitamin supplements and healthy food, healthy living, instead of keeping them in fear and, and get uh, to hang out on, uh, desperately on the, <clears throat> on the hope of a virus, uh, a vaccine that's, God knows when it's gonna come. You know, it's gonna take six to month to at least a year for a real effective vaccine. And yet, <clears throat> by the time it comes around, it will still be untested. And so we don't know what kind of reaction we're going to get from that. And all the people with a weakened immune system already, probably based on past experience with vaccine, will suffer from it. So, yeah, uh, I, you I know, explain me, I, explain me how the health experts are not focusing on teaching us how to live healthy and, and protect ourselves the natural way instead of forcing medication, more medication on us. Well, you're talking about a huge systematic, systemic problem that, I, that the whole reason I myself am in integrative medicine as well, because we are not getting the right messages out to the public, even starting in medical school training, uh, all the way through any type of medical training. If you're talking about the health experts, um, we, we, we really are talking about long-term goals here of trying to get people thinking healthy about food and diet and nutrition. And it's just this moment in time where it, we're, we're looking at a mirror to ourselves, we're holding a mirror to ourselves as a society where we're into instant gratification. And part of that has to do with relying on something to fix us, very similar to the way, you know, a vaccine, similar to the way we, you know, as a culture, hold on to medications as an instant gratification fix all. The hard work, as you and I both know, comes from really understanding not just what food does to our body, but what exercise does to our body, what sleep has done, you know, does to our body in terms of its healthfulness, stress management, which is, you know, quite, a, you know, harmful to the human body uh, and to the human gut microbiome. So the acidic changes, um, the medications, again, are part of the problem. Uh, unless they're absolutely necessary, there's many other alternatives to medications, but it takes hard work. And society is not really, uh, you know, geared up emotionally uh, to do hard work when it comes to human health, or else we wouldn't have the numbers of diabetics and pre-diabetics even before coming across COVID. I well, mean, you, you, you would think with an emergency like this, people, people would reconsider their life and instead of getting fatter and fatter because they sit on their butt uh, watching TV all day long, the news that's going to scare them out of their mind. Uh, I, I see a lot of complaints on Facebook, people are getting weight, getting weight. It's like, yeah. I haven't gained one ounce since I started. I keep the same discipline diet that I've been following all along. I added a few supplements and I'm fine. I feel fine and I'm not scared. And I resent people are trying to scare us out of our mind and and house arrest us. So to go to come on the practical side, what would be your recommendation as far as um, healthy alternative vitamin supplements, other other ways to keep your body healthy and and allow your body and your immune system to fight off this virus? Well, I think also adding the piece of environmental chemicals and how chemicals affect inflammation in the body that lead to comorbidities such as obesity, heart disease, um, insulin resistance. We, I, I really, uh, and, and of course, you know, I have a book coming out talking about how to reduce environmental chemicals. All of the chemicals that we buy in our products, our cleaning products, our cooking utensils that are plastic, um, our flame retardant chemicals, our food chemicals, our drinking water chemicals, the air pollution chemicals from air fresheners and, uh, you know, fabric softeners. So, you know, I'm, I want people to think not just about clean eating, which is so critical to human health, but also clean drinking water yeah. and how to filter your water so you're not contributing the chemicals that cause inflammation 
that lead to chemical to comorbidities and disease that lead to an inflammatory response severely to COVID. Uh, and that's the line of thinking. So we want to, you know, think about um, uh, how to get rid of these products, how to choose better uh, products and have the resources to do it. So again, the book that I'm, that's coming out soon is called Non-Toxic Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World. But understanding how those chemicals are very critical to the COVID response and the inflammatory response is really quite important. And mm -hmm. we know that those chemicals raise inflammatory markers like IL-6, IL-17, um, and C-reactive protein. And those are heightened in an inflammatory response, such as an infection uh, like coronavirus. So yeah, again, you're, you're addressing a good point. Uh, our, our home environment is can be more toxic than the outside environment. And we also forgot to mention GMOs, which is another toxin in our food. So uh, people need to be aware that we, in a normal house environment, we are surrounded by toxic products. I don't use any toxic products. I have a few basic natural cleaning setup. I don't use any um, scents or anything like this. If I use it, uh, you know, it would be a essential oil like lavender or something like this. Um, it's it's a whole education that we need to do, but we're fighting against heavy marketing and heavy brainwashing from the sick care establishment, I call it sick care, because people are so used to take drugs for everything instead of thinking about natural alternatives. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, I wrote seven books on food and health, and people don't care. They're not interested. You know, they're only interested in short term, you know, what ple pleases them now um, what's going to fix them right right away, even though their condition has been growing for the past 10 or 20 years, they you, you're right. They don't want to do the hard work, and that's very frustrating. Yeah, it is frustrating. I, you know, I'll tell you that my experience with my patients is that people, if they're lucky enough to have the time to do so, are taking very good care of themselves. Uh, I think the extreme is that now's the time if you have it, if you're blessed to not be an essential worker um, where you have to be out in the, in the mess every day. I mean, if you have the ability to take the time to start cooking food instead of buying takeout, um, you know, to open your windows for fresh air as opposed to using commercial products for air freshening, which is nonsense and toxic or cleaning products that you don't need or using vinegar instead of, you know, uh, you know, Windex and Lysol and all those commercial products, which are filled with some really horrible stuff. So, you know, I think um, this is a really rare opportunity in human history to take a moment and reestablish your, your being um, as a creature on earth and deciding what is necessary for human health. We don't need the products. The marketing establishment for commercial products is enormous to make you think you need to be antibacterial and uber clean and using chemicals like triclosan and antibacterial chemicals. These are really not helpful to the human body. Now, on surfaces right now, we might need to use a disinfectant like isopropyl alcohol. Um, um, I, I use, uh, I, I spray, um, uh, what is it called? Um, colloidal silver and or um, hydrogen peroxide as a way to control that. And that's, oh, that's, yeah. all, that's all. I don't need a toxic... Uh, additional toxic products. Uh, both of these are natural products and, and they've been using in, uh, in hospitals for a long time. So it's been yeah. proven to kill virus and bacteria. And I think those are good choices. And then of course, soap and water. Washing for yeah. 20 seconds with just pure soap and water is, yeah. is enough to remove the bacteria or the virus. It doesn't necessarily kill it, it just removes it. Um, it's not a disinfectant, which is often not necessary. Um, and that's the difference between cleaning versus disinfecting. Again, another topic I talk about in the book so that people can understand how aggressive they need to go. Um, and really that there's a whole host of natural alternatives to the commercial chemicals that are filled with lots of 
uh, endocrine disruptors, which are chemicals that affect our hormones, um, which again, contribute to the diseases that contribute to worse outcomes with COVID infections. So, mm. um, you know, instincts are going back to what our grandmother used to use or grandfather used to use to clean, uh, yeah. removing products like air fresheners, carpet cleaners, uh, any type of products that we think need to be in our home, taking them out, because again, the house is one of the places you can control, but it often is the most toxic in terms of uh, the level of chemicals that get into your home. And you can dust. I mean, dust is one of the most in, uh, toxic substances in homes. It's in corners, it's on floors. That mm -hmm. contains quite a bit of uh, flame retardant chemicals and um, a variety of toxic chemicals. And if you just dust more or use an HVAC, uh, I'm sorry, HEPA filter or a wet wipe with just water, you can remove a number of chemicals from your home um, and open in windows. It's, it's quite remarkable how that can work. Yeah. Another and thing uh, to consider also is uh, furniture, carpets, um, clothing. I only wear natural clothing. So it's either uh, wool or cotton if possible, if I can, yeah. uh, I'll do organic cotton, but if I can't stand any artificial, uh, you know, those uh, chemical uh, kind of, um, how do you say? Polyester, rayon. Yeah, polyester and all that. Rayon, I mean, nylon, yeah. yes. They're extremely uncomfortable to wear. They make you sweat. They stick to your skin. Uh, it's just, there's nothing good about them, but, uh, you know, people are still wearing them and, you know? yeah, I mean, there's all different aspects of how to remove these chemicals. I tend to tell you know, people, and I post on my platform called The Smart Human on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I post Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and all sorts of ideas. Um, but the idea that um, you know, we have to fill our home with these chemicals, that we have to wear certain clothing uh, to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. We have to do lawn care to make our lawns look perfect and clean, when in fact, cutting your lawn low, uh, short is all you need and you don't need all those chemicals tracking into your home. So, you know, um, it, it's one of those things where we've been sold a bill of goods uh, in the marketing world and we really want to just take it back to the old fashioned way of living. You know, right. non-synthetic fabrics, um, you know, they're fireproof anyway. Wool is a fireproof material. Why do you need flame retardants? Um, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of stuff that, Again, I point out that that may not be obvious. It was a journey for me, and so I'm assuming it's a journey for and the average folks out there. And I think you just take one thing at a time. You take your, you know, uh, the the concept of non-synthetic cl clothing fa uh, fabrics that don't have flame retardants that are made of natural fibers. They may cost a little more, but maybe you're going to hold on to them longer. You're going to treat them better. You're not going to dry clean them to add chemicals to your clothes so there's yep. all different ways to spend money that can be uh maybe a little upfront, but more uh, long lasting as you go through uh through over time yeah yeah so uh going back to more specific and, and and as far as yourself is concerned what um supplements we'll start with supplements we'll move on to other things what supplements would you recommend people take in order to protect themselves um, so there's so many that you can take. I'll start with that. But what I try to do is stick to some basics because that's all people can wrap their head around. And also, um, I want people to be able to afford what I'm, what I'm t discussing, which is a real issue. So, you know, I tend to tell every patient that they should be on a clean multivitamin. Um, a vitamin, which means, and by clean, I mean no chemicals, preservatives, fillers, um, doesn't, ha you know, it's third party checked for quality and quantity of what it says that's in there. So finding a clean multivitamin, and there are many good companies out there, I get paid by none to promote any of them. Uh, right. But there are remarkable numbers of good quality ones, uh, you know, um, I'll name a bunch just so I, I'm equal opportunity, New Chapter, Gaia, Pure Encapsulations, Claire Labs, Thorn. Um, uh, you know, that's just a handful of them. Yeah. So there are just I, a handful I, of good I, ones. For example, another practical um, um, advice would be to look for non-GMO certified products and, uh, and or certified organic, either way. Uh, everything, else, everything else contains genetically engineered fillers uh, or it's made with or from 
genetically engineered product like vitamin C made from GMO corn, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's only very few brands that I trust with that. And some of these are the one you mentioned actually. Yes. Good. So, I mean, yeah, I think a most integrative functional nutritionist, you know, we tend to, you know, start to understand which are the, the good players in this, in the health and, and prevention world. So a multivitamin is really essential because we have such variable diets. Um, we have variable access to good, clean food, um, busy people, um, cost, and also because food, so, you know, soil of our, of our food is so variable that we can't rely on our food, um, you know, to really give us all the nutrients. Even organic, you know, foods can travel, you know, three months and be frozen in warehouses before it ships off to a local health food store or a supermarket. So mm -hmm. another tip on that for food is to always think about um, organic, frozen organics, because you can also get all the healthful um, nutrients from frozen organics because they're typically flash frozen. So and you can also buy local at your farmer's market. Absolutely. Local doesn't always mean uh, organic. And you can also wash non-organic produce with one part vinegar, three parts water or baking soda to remove those pesticide residues. But you're right, from a nutrient value, the more recent your food was picked, the more likely it's going to have higher nutrient quality. So local is great to support farmers. Um, uh, the second thing I recommend people to have checked is a vitamin D level. It's not typically done unless it's asked for, but vitamin D is incredibly important to the human body. There are over 4, 000, uh, 400 um, physiologic effects of vitamin D on the human body, and most of which are immunologic. So having not just a vitamin D level checked, but getting that vitamin D level up to the high normal levels, not above normal, but high normal value is where it's most physiologic benef physiologically beneficial. And it's a challenge to do that because most pills will not raise vitamin D uh, that high. I, I, often I, have, uh, I, I have to uh, put in the comment here, What's, what I feel ironic is that they are telling us to stay inside, which prevents us to be in the sun, which is how you get your natural vitamin D. So it's a vicious circle. You know, you, you, you're not exposing yourself to fresh air and sun and, uh, you know, continue, continue the cycle of not uh, strengthening your immune system. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. That's, that's, where, that's where being bored actually is um, an advantage because you've got a soda collector on top. <laughs> You yeah. see, some people are benefiting, but, you know, it's, it's um, you, I think you're totally correct in that. I think, you know, now that we have the summer months, it's good to be out. It's good to get some vitamin D on your skin. It, I found as a clinician that no matter how much sun you get, it's usually not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just the way modern day is working these days. You'd have to have, you know, a lot of hours outside with at least some skin protection so you don't get skin cancers. But I would say that getting a level is the way to start. So you know what you're dealing with and what you need to uh, supplement with. Um, and I was mentioning that pills have to go through 24 feet of bowel. And that's a lot of tubing of the GI tract to get through to be absorbed. So I often will put patients on uh, vitamin D drops under the tongue uh, where they just walk around for a few minutes with those drops. And usually that changes the level really quite quickly uh, to a good level. But you don't want to overshoot. Um, and you do want to get a level and have someone monitor it because vitamin D is one of the four fatty vitamins. There's A, E, D, and K. And you can end up taking too much of a fatty vitamin, which stores in the body, and you can run into some trouble there. So it's not, it's not common, but certainly with vitamin D, which is oily and we store it, you don't want to overshoot. Um, so generally 2000 IU international units of D is a nice place to start for most people since we're all pretty deficient. But I do really encourage getting a baseline level and also checking in three months to see what you're supplementing, um, how that's changed your numbers to be safe. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, since the uh, beginning of the confinement, I've never been so thin because I'm going to the swimming pool next, next door and I get an hour sun every day, and that, that's my medication. No, um, it's and, yeah. Another thing to mention also is supporting our uh, gut, uh, gut health, so probiotics. Yes, probiotics are a winner. 
And I was saying this long before COVID. I mean, these are all my recommendations for human health. I, I call this human fertilizer mm -hmm. because even kids should be on this, adults, whether you're sick or whether you're perfectly healthy, in modern day living with all of the chemicals that are part of our lives and all of the lack of exercise and stress and sleep problems, we really need to supplant, we need fertilizer to make the body kind of work at its best. And so first was multi, second was vitamin D, and then I, I recommend probiotic, absolutely, but you really need to go with good brands. It is one of the types of things where you get what you pay for. If it's junk, it's you're gonna know it's junk. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but it is a rather, you know, I would say expensive expense because you, it has so much to do with the quality and the care and the purity of that probiotic. But I generally recommend for people who are otherwise healthy with no major gastrointestinal problems, that 20 billion of a diverse set of bacteria on the label, uh, a vetted brand, um, and then you go higher for people who may have ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, um, you know, some type of bowel-related condition. And again, should be dealt with with the primary care doctor or a family medicine doctor or integrative medicine doctor like myself. But you want to have someone to weigh in on what you're doing because people get hurt from supplements. You have to be very careful. Um, oh, should I go on fourth? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Fourth thing I recommend is omega-3 fish oil or from plants, from, you know, flax, omega-3, because, you know, we, our brains are made up of EPA and DHA fatty acids, um, certainly fish oil, if it's cleaned properly and there's no heavy metals and it's vetted for that, um, is very similar to the human brain and our brains are made up of it. So, uh, you know, omega-3s are good for macular eye degeneration. Uh, it's good for Alzheimer's prevention, Parkinson's disease. In fact, almost every Alzheimer's protocol uh, in my world is, is, uh, has omega-3 fish oil included in uh, the list of supplements that are part of the program. So, you know, it's brain food. It's also very good for sleep in children. It's very good for inflammation for all of the joint diseases that I deal with as a rheumatologist. Um, and so it's just very high yield. It's just also one of those ones where quality matters, brands matter, and certainly how much you take should be matched to what you're trying to treat or else you can overdo it. It also thins the blood. So if you have any history of um, bleeding disorders or blood clotting disorders, you really want to make sure you take it carefully and also stop it before any procedures like an aspirin or something of that sort. So there's nuances, but those are the four key ones that I would say in general and then you can lop on, say, zinc if you're not getting enough from your multi. My multi has enough zinc to be protected, 25 milligrams for COVID, uh, generally speaking. Um, you could argue that quercetin is an antioxidant, which also comes from food, but not at that amount. You'd have to have an awful lot of apples and onions to get that amount. But uh, quercetin is a wonderful antioxidant, not very expensive. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole variety of uh, people argue melatonin, but I would say I'm not a big fan of melatonin just because I want your body to make it instead of taking it in from the outside. So, right. Right. um, you know, I worry about melatonin as a recommendation. Yeah. I'd like to address the issue of cost. Um, I'm 67. I spend an average of $150 in supplements good quality supplements every month. Mm -hmm. Compare that to uh, some of my friends that are constantly going to the doctor, that are taking half a dozen different medication that cost them hundreds of dollars. And, 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 and think of what, what makes sense, what makes the most sense to do prevention and take care of yourself or you're gonna end up paying thousands of dollars in doctors, hospitals, uh, medicine, and so on and so forth. And then some of it's just common sense, you know, stick it to the man, stay healthy. And you, I mean, I, I went to a checkup recently for Medicare and, uh, and the nurse asked me a bunch of questions and I said, what do you ask me all these stupid questions? She said, well, because people at your age, usually they have all these problems or most of these problems. I say, I'm fine, I'm healthy. I don't have blood pressure, you know, everything is fine. And uh, she was almost shocked that, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was healthy at my age. Some people assume that, uh, and, and it's also kind of 
ingrained into you that past a certain age you should stop being sick and and rely on the healthcare system to keep your life. What's the point of living long life if you live it miserably because you're constantly sick? I am in agreement with that. I think um, you're absolutely right. It's paying up front, putting in the time and effort so that you're, you know, but it's again, it's, it goes against most human nature, which is instant gratification. Um, you know, it's kind of built into the culture with media now. I mean, everyone wants to be famous and no one has a skill set. So, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where it's, it's a hard sell. Listen, I look at it like a faith a little bit because it's not like a cancer is going to come up to you and not, you know, tap you on the shoulder and say, thanks, Bob, for, you know, taking all your vitamins. I, you know, I'm not going to have give you cancer for another five to 10 more years. We don't have that kind of feedback of the future. And so there is a faith involved with prevention that you have to sell to a patient, or at least that's what I have to do often, is because I need to tell them that the work you pay, use now or do now is going to pay off. They have to buy into it. Um, and again, it's, it's not always an easy sell. Usually people who have had loved ones that are ill are much more vulnerable and able to be receptive to that message um, but it, or themselves if they were ill and then all of a sudden they turn on, you know, the listening skills of prevention, but it's just not something that I think is pervasive in our society. And you can see that reflective in the obesity, uh, um, problem in our country and around the world, because, you know, that's reflective of people's choices on an ongoing basis. Right. Right. Another, um, Thing to remember, remind people is that we can actually have an effect on their health, our own health. Uh, modern, you know, research has uh, proven through epigenetics that we can actually improve our health. Um, I come from, uh, uh, my father died of cancer. So a lot of people will say, oh my God, I'm going to die of cancer. Well, I'm already five years older than my dad when he died of cancer. And I've been taking certain products as, you know, preventive again, preventative again, as in case to or to prevent cancer cells to, to develop in my body. Uh, one of them was recommended by my friend Mark right here, the hydrogen peroxide, which is a known um, antitoxin. And it will, uh, another one is uh, a very simple, which is... Um, Baking soda, which is uh, will alkal alkalinize your body, because cancer cells love acidic environment, and there's many other issues. But the, my point is, do not think because someone in your family has a certain disease that you are you're gonna get it, or you are. Um, a lot of a lot of doctors tell you, well, it's in your DNA, so there's nothing you can do about it. I absolutely disagree with that well the science supports what you're saying so uh what you're describing is epigenetics mm -hmm. and really it's how environment affects our genetic template our dna and it's turning out and science is supporting this that almost 90 percent of chronic illness is not genetic it's environmental yes but environmental not just chemicals and diet and food and water but also stress air quality yes. sleep mm -hmm. so you are spot on my father is in his 80s not wood and uh his whole family had heart attacks early and died in their 50s they were also overweight and didn't take care of themselves my father exercises every day uh even though he has uh, you know health issues knees and arthritis and what have you but you know i think and i don't even ask a very extensive family history in my practice. I don't spend a lot of time on that, even though I think it is helpful in certain areas like uh, breast cancer, where we know specific genes or issues or certain types of colon cancer, we know are very genetically transmitted. Um, most diseases are environmental and lifestyle plays a key role in prevention. So whether you have an APOE4 gene, one or two copies, you can work on these things, you can prevent whether those genes become expressed, that's epigenetics. And, and lifestyle keeps some of those diseases suppressed from, being, from actually becoming a clinical illness. So I agree with you, and that's the messaging. You have control over your health. 
um, more than you actually think you do. And when people know that, then it's on them to really do the work. So that's just another angle of motivation, I think, that's helpful. Right, right. But you want, you know, the, the medical system uh, wants to keep you in fear and they want you to keep you to keep you sick so that you, you know, you make them rich. And uh, I, I, yeah, I'm absolutely against that. Going back to uh, the COVID situation, uh, w one of my concern is uh, the potential for emotional issues, uh, depression, you know, things like that, because people now are separated from their friends, they're separated from social connections, community, and so on. And even though I'm, you know, I'm a tough cookie and I'm an introvert, I don't really need so much social interaction. It started to get on to me, you know, it's, it's like I'm sick and tired of just not being able to see my friends and, and be able to socialize. Uh, even though I'm not a party anymore, you know, getting along with friends and for dinner or whatever. Um, what's your take on the potential for, uh, you know, a combination of depression, uh, potentially uh, home violence, you know, uh, the anger issues and so on and so forth due to this confinement or all these, these constraint that they are put on us? Yeah, and add to and great points and add to that also food insecurity and add to that, you know, home insecurity and losing your home and losing your job, feeding your children, in addition to the social isolation. I mean, we're really in a pickle and I think we're gonna see the the ramifications of this situation for years to come, even on our children who are hopefully young and insulated from a lot of the world's pain and suffering. Um what I'm trying to, to share with uh, the smart human followers that follow me and, and um, also, I guess, in this book, I hate to plug the book so much, but I, I really do think there's so much valuable information that's pertinent right now to, to COVID, is that we can go out into society but be smart about it. Um, playing into the same idea that we talked about masks or shields or which hand sanitizers or, you know, I walk around, um, you know, with a bottle of isopropyl alcohol and a spray, spray nozzle. Um, and everywhere I go, you know, if I go to a dinner with, with family and we go out to a restaurant, I'll just, you know, quickly spray down the chairs and the tables and I'll sit there and, and I'll take on the moment. So I think that um, going out or being in nature, which is free, which is open, which is not claustrophobic, you know, walking with friends at a very safe distance, um, having dinner on patios, which is what we've been doing a lot, you know, this summer, uh, having our kids play at a reasonable distance. They're older, but they're, you know, not toddlers. I think that we have to start to figure out how to balance the isolation and the mental uh, conditions that we all baseline have, anxiety, depression, with you know, with the potential of just getting out and being more, more social, doing it safely. And I think that's the balance. Um, as I move out around in the world, I'm posting on ideas that I believe are reasonable and safe and responsible to others, not just to ourselves right. and our own needs. And I think we have to think about the elderly and all the immunocompromised. It's, it's on us as a society, even if we don't always believe the science or we think you know, there's a hoax or it's overinflated or there's too much fear, I get it. Uh, we have to be responsible to be, uh, to be part of society and not hurt anyone as well. Yeah, and, and another thing I've noticed because obviously I have time to read a lot and I like to read is uh, the, the, the rate of suicide is going up. Mm -hmm. the, we already had an epidemic of um, opioid you know, um, abuse and other drugs, parts and, and so on. Uh, I don't think this is going to get any better anytime soon with, with the condition as it is. And, and uh, adding to all the stress of losing your job, not getting your job back, not paying your rent or your mortgage, losing your house potentially, the kids not being able to go back to school, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you, you add all the stress together and that affects your immune system as well, stress. Yeah, and you can't afford supplements or, you know, I mean, it's like it all ties back to how well we take care of ourselves. We have to fight it. We have to, you know, there are times I get up in the morning and I don't feel like exercising, that I do feel down. 
And, uh, you know, I force myself to do a run. I force myself to do, uh, uh, you know, activities that make my body feel better, that make my brain feel better. I try to eat a great meal in the morning so that I, my whole day feels a little bit more positive. I know I'm feeding the gut microbiome better and it's playing out in better brain health. Um, you know, I, I make a phone call to a friend. I'll do a web, you know, a Zoom meeting. I'll walk in nature. I have, you know, plenty of colleagues that are therapists that I think are excellent at helping people work through some of these issues. And I think we should reach out, especially if there's thoughts of suicide, to really reach out to train professionals who know how to to really talk to patients in a in a very smart way and are, and um, and are effective. And these are free. You can actually find these helplines. Um, quite, quite, you know, easily online. So, you know, I just encourage people to, you know, we will get through this. We had the 1918 pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we will get through this. It will take probably longer than we're hoping. Um, but now is the time being summer in most parts of the world that we can really take advantage of nature. We can yeah. exercise, we can get fresh vegetables from local farmers, we can grow our own. And I think that also is a moment where we say, you know what, get everything in now as best you can, take, take care of your primary health, primary care health needs, get your mammography, get your uh, blood pressure checked, uh, get your eye examined, I'm doing that with my kids, you know, let's get everything in now and get all that exercise and energy in and out now, because it may actually be pretty um, gloomy when the weather changes. Um, yeah. We don't have that added value of, of outdoor socializing and stuff like that. So, right. Another issue we could, uh, we could talk about uh, is uh, rest, so sleep, and also, uh, hopefully, because I know it's easy to talk about it, it's not easy to do it, but, uh, other methods of relaxation, like meditation, prayer, if you believe in that. Uh, what are your, what is your take on that? Yeah, wonderful. Um, journaling, writing down your thoughts, uh, guided meditation, meditation without guided uh, imagery. I mean, a lot of these apps on the phone are wonderful now. Zen, uh, relax and rest, calm. There's so many wonderful resources that are available for so little, in, you know, cost. Um, but yes, spiritual, you know, churches, synagogues, mosques, they're all holding services online with Zoom. Um, you know, we're really learning how to use our, our you know, network um, to pull in some very important aspects of our lives, community, spiritual, um, pets. You know, it's been wonderful for people to go out and adopt pets during this time. Yes. Um, assuming you can care for them and pay for their food and, and really do, do right by them, it is enormously beneficial to have a pet with you when you're isolated, especially the elderly. Um, and you're doing such a wonderful service for these animals. So, you know, there's lots of ways to fill your heart and soul. Uh, you just have to be open-minded and explore a little. Right. So uh, I think we've gone around most. Oh, let me double check here. Um, so we talk about emotional, we talk about exercise. Um, do you have uh, any personal stories of, uh, you know, how you managed to get through this uh, without, you know, uh, <laughs> major issue, breaking down or whatever? Maybe something, a little story that can help uh, other people out there maybe? Yeah, I think the first time I ventured out, uh, we, we were in for a couple good months and didn't really go out or do anything. And we went out for my husband's birthday. Um, it was the first time we had gone out to a restaurant and it happened to be a friend who owns the restaurant. But what was so exciting about that is that he he had really made an effort to to do everything that was recommended by the CDC in terms of the hostesses and the and the servers and their cleanliness and their masks. And, you know, we didn't sit with masks. The servers took on that responsibility. There was a line you couldn't go into the bathroom with more than one person. And I was, I was really, um, I think we chose a restaurant or, you know, and I'm sure people know which ones that, that are really taking the care that, that put us at ease and felt that we could do this. We could do this with our own responsibility and their responsibility working together. And uh, we had a wonderful evening. That was just a very eye-opening experience and we were very scared to do it. Um, and then again, 
tips like carrying around a certain bottle with, with the right disinfectant to, to give you uh, control, wearing the right mask or shield. I wear a shield uh, and with a mask sometimes, but, but mostly a shield that goes below my chin uh, by two or three inches. You know, they're not all perfect measures, um, but they're better than nothing and they allow you to get out a little more and, so, and, and go walking with friends if you want to or, um, you know, so I think from a personal experience, I'm learning along with everyone else, but I do follow all the CDC guidelines and I go to um, locations and, and businesses that, that respect that as well so that I feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um... You've been dying to talk about it, so uh, can you tell us about the upcoming book? Oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm dying to talk about it, not because it really makes me any money, I can assure you, but um, it's taken eight years to work on this book. It, it, I mean, I can't tell you how much effort, um, time, time spent. I'm on, I, I'll show you a picture. I haven't even gotten the copy yet, believe it or not, because it's coming out to me, and I guess in like two weeks or a week or so. Um, but anyway, it's the consumer version of a textbook that myself and Dr. Fred Vomsal did in 2017. Actually, I think we talked about it on the last time I was on your show. Mm -hmm. um, this was a textbook, but it's a guidebook, and it's a guidebook that doesn't exist right now, um, and it's how to live healthfully in a chemical world. It's called Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World because I'm teaching people about which drinking water filters to think about and why, and how to get to those resources. It's, all, it's filled with resources and information, um, and it's for everyday people, and it's for any socioeconomic background and any uh, scientific background. And um, I think it's really important to get it into the hands of people to, to really make a difference in their reduction of chemical exposure, which reduces chronic disease. The goal of this book is to keep people healthy and not get breast cancer and not get autoimmune disease and not get Alzheimer's. And these simple ways can lead down that road to, to doing so. So um, I hope people will embrace it and share it widely because uh, it's my heart. Oh, well, great. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Mark? Ah, right. Uh, actually, one of the things I was going to ask is about the book, actually. Um, simply because, uh, Ailey, you said that 90% of health problems are due to environmental uh, conditions. Right. Can you, can you elucidate on that a bit? What type sure. of health conditions that are, are the most impactful on or detrimental to our health? So, to begin with, you would have to argue that what we ingest is critical, so food and water. And the, the contaminants in food and water are such a bolus to your body, such a bo they add such a body burden of chemicals to your body on a regular basis, mm. um, that that's something they each have their own chapter in the book. So, clean drinking water, drinking water is actually its own chapter, food and diet, nutrition, how to read labels, how to understand GMO, pesticides in our food, all of these things are very simplistically laid out, but also the what to do, where to find the information, what to pick. It's so important to have the story from what the problem is, but what the solution is too. Um, another really big contributor to human health is air pollution. Um, we now see that people who live in, in more polluted cities have higher rates of severe reaction to COVID. Not infection so much, but reaction. Again, the inflammatory process that underlies living in an environment with, with heavy air pollution. Higher rates of suicide, anxiety and depression among those living in cities that are highly polluted, like in Beijing and parts of China and Pakistan. We know this. The data is very clear on it. So not that you can always control the outside environment, but you can certainly control the indoor air quality. And that's what we focus on, is what you can control. Um, so yeah, it's built on, on what we are empowered to do. Uh, and not the negative, but the positive. It sounds like shortly after your book's released that there's going to be a move for people wanting to move to the countryside. You know, listen, I would love to say that's so perfect, but believe it or not, I just spent the last four weeks working with my local farmer not to spray glyphosate out my back door. 20 feet from my kids' house, uh, rooms. Mm, so, wow. you know, you know what, what we're dealing with now is that, that so much glyphosate has been used. I mean, it's been banned in Mexico recently. 
of the whole, it's been banned. Decambia was banned. Uh, now they're negotiating glyphosate being banned in Europe. Um, but I have a farmer in my town. I mean, our, we're a farming town. New Jersey's the, the garden state. Right. And, uh, and through really wonderful conversation and being warm and non-confrontational, um, I've managed to have a very reasonable conversation with this very old school, old time farmer. And, uh, you know, I think it's the best way to handle these, these situations is not through uh, vinegar, but through honey. And, you know, we'll see if we can make a, a change long term on this decision. But right for now, we're not getting sprayed for this season. And, and hopefully, you know, I'm working with a, an actual um, weed researcher and he's actually a French weed re researcher that works at a Rutgers University and he's trying to teach us both how and when to apply um, non-toxic organic herbicide to a growing weed, uh, especially with selective seeds from, from Bayer or Monsanto. So it's right. been a really interesting learning process. So when you say go to the country, it makes me chuckle. Like, like it's so perfect where I live, I'm battling this out too. So, you know, we all have our battles. This is very true. Um, before we go any further, I mean, you've given us a lot of information already. So where can people get hold of more information about you, about all the things you write and that sort of thing, your websites and social social presence? Uh, thank you for asking. So so my, my uh, big way to inform the public on all these topics, air, water, baby food, mental health, are through thesmarthuman.com thesmarthuman.com and then I post on the smart human on Facebook the smart human on Twitter and Instagram regularly and I work quite hard at those posts um, and then in terms of my practice if people are interested in becoming a patient I do telemedicine like everyone else I was doing it even before COVID but uh, my website for my practice is aleycohenmd.com which is spelled a-l-y-c-o-h-e-n-m-d.com and, uh, you know, uh, I see pretty much everyone for everything, including children and non-rheumatologic illnesses, environmental exposure. So it's, it's been a really interesting, um, uh, I love my job. And it's just a very interesting process to see what comes knocking on my door. So, hmm. yeah. Super, Jack. Thank you. Now, now, back to the matter in hand. I mean, how much stock do you put into the suggestion there's going to be a second wave? Um, it's a great question. I don't claim to be an epidemiologist, even though I listen to them wholeheartedly, uh, especially Dr. Fauci. But um, I would say that I'm not sure we're going to get out of the first wave. Uh, I think that the second wave was implying that we would get it contained and that there would be, of course, some outbreaks that would lead to a potential outbreak from being indoors. Um, I'm sad to, to, it's sad to hear that, you know, sort of the heat and the summer months uh, are not stopping the virus. It's, it's not keeping us from being contagious, which shows you the level of virulence of this particular virus, that it didn't go away seasonally, which we had all hoped. So unfortunately, I think we're going to be in this for another year, and then it probably, I'm hoping, would I have no evidence for this, but I would hope that it's gonna eventually um, come out of our system. But we may potentially have more to come. I mean, we know that zoonotic illnesses are not so unheard of and that there may be more, especially with climate change mm -hmm. um, and really animals and humans interacting so intricately. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be hopeful. I have children. Um, I believe in, in the future being bright. Um, but I think we have to be smart and, and careful um, without uh, being overwhelmed um and and get everything in right now that we can and live for the moment live for the day of, of nature and eating and socializing in the best way possible because um we may have some tough months ahead i have another question if i may what's your take on herd immunity um well it exists in my understanding since it's been a while since my my epidemiology classes is that really you need 60 to 70 percent of the population has to have had exposure or antibodies um to really create protection for those who have not been either vaccinated or exposed to that um, virus or bacteria so um you know to obtain a 60 to 70 percent herd immunity for this virus has been uh, apparently difficult um uh, and I'm not well, sure it won't it won't happen if you keep people inside and constantly protected too but we I also mean, it's a vicious circle because you 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 keep people away from 
you know, strengthening your immune system through, you know, uh, contact with other people. And so in doing so, you keep them still more fragile. And, uh, and, and of course, it goes in the sense of some of these people, especially pharmaceutical companies, they want to sell the vaccine and they don't want your immune system to get stronger. So Sweden it seems uh, to be very successful at herd immunity. Actually, Sweden is failing at, he at herd immunity, some of their numbers. I mean, I guess it depends on what you pick out as the numbers. But remember, herd immunity is built on the premise that antibodies are protective. And at this point, we actually do not know if the antibodies are protective to COVID. And I think if we get more data on that, I think you're, you know, you're absolutely correct. Being indoors, obviously, is going to try to decrease the the exposure and people getting affected um, because we don't want to get the severe effects, which are death, right? Hospitalization, death. But, but remember, herd immunity is actually built on the premise that once you're exposed to an infectious issue, your antibodies then protect you from getting it again. And we still don't really, you know, there is questions as to whether you can get um, infected again. And we see that from European studies. Um, so until that data plays out, I don't know if we can make the argument that that everyone should be going to COVID parties. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, right. And especially because those folks are bringing it home to the vulnerable people, such as parents and grandparents and babies and immune suppressed. So, you know, I, yeah, I totally uh, respect you know, your point, but I'm, I'm, it, I'm leery of the data right now. On, let's on keep our in mind, let's keep in mind that 99 point something percent of the people that get affected live, survive, and they're fine. So, all this, uh, the all these scare tactics about 0.8 percent of people that actually are affected. It's to me, it's just scare tactics. You know, we should we should focus on the positive and not just scare people out of their mind based only on on the small, tiny percentage of people being affected. I know it's not good. I know that people are affected. It's not. But a lot of it also has to do with their previous health um, uh, status. And, you know, it's, we need to face fact and, and stop spreading fear by focusing only on the negative and not on the positive, which is the vast majority of people survive this. And for some of them, for most of them, it's just like a regular flu and they and they get done with it in, in a few days. So um, the, the numbers are really that 80% of people worldwide from all the different studies, be it in Seattle, but Italy, um, uh, South Korea, we have good data, is that about 80% of people who experience uh, a COVID or a coronavirus infection will be otherwise either not symptomatic or very mild symptoms. You're correct on that. The 15 to 20 percent um, that do not do as well and are becoming symptomatic may go on to what stage two and three are considered as an inflammatory process. And then there's the 5 percent that will go through cytokine storm, which involves a whole vast array of humoral immunity, which is the antibodies have begun to start coming out. But you have these cytokines, which are part of the immune system, which are overreactive. The question of who is going to be in that 80% versus the 15 to 20 versus the 5% that go on to cytokine storm is really where we're at and trying to figure out who those people are. And we know, again, comorbidities, but there are many outliers to this theory in terms of children that are otherwise healthy. And again, um, adults that are not having more than one comorbidity, such as hypertension, which is a vast majority of people. So... You know, I agree with you. Let's focus on the positive. Let's and part of that is just being protective and, and proactive. Um, but I think the people that are are getting the sickest are also people that may not have had access to care and, and health equity. They may not have had a lifetime of good health, uh, you know, access to good clean food, and they haven't been able to exercise because they're taking on three jobs. Mm -hmm. They're essential workers, and I think we have to be fair to the people that just it's not by choice it's by circumstance that they're in this situation. Mm -hmm. And I think it bears weight to just to be respectful to that, that portion of society, which we know who they are, 
who, um, you know, if they had better choices, would often take them. So right, I agree. Yeah. In that case, we should, again, should have done what Korea does, which is test everybody, the people that are actually sick, put them in quarantine, keep the rest of the population out there and, and interacting with each other with a mask or, or without, because typically Asian wear mask uh, is part of their culture. They've been uh, trained to do that. Uh, but instead, what they do is they confine all or the majority of the population and they don't typically protect the one that are really affected. You know, well, I mean, yes. Yeah, I think the problem is, is that we don't know who is affected. You know, when you have asymptomatic spread where people are otherwise healthy but are literally carrying the, the infection around and breathing on people and being interacting, those well, that's are what people. that's why tests are there for. You but the test, test, people. Not, the test is not perfect. We we know that there are false positives, there are false negatives. I had a patient whose husband died, um, who had three negative tests and was on a ventilator during the height of COVID. I mean, so the test itself didn't really tell anyone anything because the guy was on a ventilator and you know, so the point is is that I the, because the testing situation has been so poor in terms of the quality false negatives, false positives, and because it has asymptomatic spread so clearly, as we, we know, then you really don't know who to isolate. That's the problem. And so it really takes a society to just do very basic um, behaviors, such as wearing a mask, um, to really help quiet down. We have data from communities that do wear masks that the numbers do go down. So I think any way you look at it, it's not a hard sell just to wear a mask. I think people are just, um, you know, there, there's so many layers to this of why people won't wear a mask when in fact it's really not difficult in the right areas and in communities and when you're close to people. Um, it, it really does show that it's the best way to get through this if we can. And so um, it's going to be hard to shake me on those on those facts, but um, I respect your opinion, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things I wanted to ask you, Ailey, is um, what about essential workers? I mean, you mentioned them twice um, so far. They are in a, a difficult position. What would you recommend that they do in order to um, reduce the environmental factors mm -hmm. that could be detrimental to them and increase the um, the health factors that will help them be healthier, more immune and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think starting a diet right now when they're in the middle of, of the war is, is a hard ask, um, but I would say it certainly never hurts to start taking care of yourself now. I mean, there's no better time to get our health in order than right at this moment. If, mm -hmm. if there was ever a message from the world, it certainly is now. Um, so I would say uh, definitely taking better care of themselves, eating better, cleaner, sleeping better if they are able to. Essential workers, you know, even teachers, not just bus drivers and, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we have teachers that are really freaking out, and rightly so. They're about to walk into a potentially harmful. There are teachers that are writing their wills. I mean, because they're really that upset, they can't quit their jobs. They need an income, um, and they're being potentially, uh, you know, kind of pushed into a situation where they have no choice. So, yeah, um, but chi but but children are supposedly not caring. No children. So again. Care. No, children do carry. The latest study came out yesterday from, or two days ago from JAMA. It was a well-done study. Children ages 10 to 19 can transfer, transmit virus asymptomatically as well and efficiently as adults, ages 10 through 19. Right. Younger, maybe lower, lower efficiency for doing so. But this is really well-known data now that we have enough from Europe added on to American data you know, we really have to think about that. How many kids are 10 through 19 going through schools? Uh, I'm sure you heard of the, the teachers that were in Texas, I believe. Three teachers doing remote teaching got together in a room with masks in a clean environment in a room in Texas to teach their students remotely through the computer. Three, one had transmitted to each other, to the, to the other two, and one died. And this is not even being around kids. Well, so we, that's a, uh, if, if nothing else, that's a proof that the masks don't work. Well, it proves that, um, you know, there may have been touching on surfaces. They t it, there's so many variables to, they weren't closely 
connected to each other, but it shows you that it's an imperfect system to put people together when they potentially could share virus. And so I'm not arguing that we don't need schooling. Trust me, I have two kids. I want them in school. But I think, you know, um, we, we need to, we need to, you know, every situation is different, but I, you know, I would hope that essential workers would get the proper, just like medical workers, proper PPE, you know, protective equipment, um, being, you know, taught in how to clean their environment, giving socially distanced, get, having the, the square footage of a school to really keep themselves safe. You know, I think you'd want that for your spouse, wife, you know, uh, children, grandchildren. It's, it's just one of those things that, it's going to be difficult. I'm not saying there's any right answer. It's just going to be something we have to think about. Yeah, I have a real life um, uh, example. Uh, I go to the same grocery store. I've been going to the same grocery stores for more than 20 years. <coughs> so I know all, all the people, um, not all of them, but most of the people in there. And every time I go, I, I ask him, uh, has anybody been sick in the store? And for the past four months, all I've been told is one person, one out of hundreds of employees working there, facing customers every single day, one got sick and didn't die, just came back to work eventually after quarantine and so on. So uh, m most company, I would say, they are doing, taking the right precaution, distancing, mask, and so on and so forth. And so, um, what I'm seeing from that kind of information, I know it's not an official uh, study or anything, but from observation and asking people that I know and working every day together and with customers, the, the, the infection rate in this particular environment is really not nothing to be afraid of. Well, that may be the case. I mean, you know, again, every, I mean, New Jersey has a lower count today than it did the other week. Can I tell you that everyone in my town represents that those numbers? Not necessarily. I think you're looking at just, you know, pockets of your, and, and it's framing your perception, no doubt. But it doesn't always mean that that's, you know, the, that's the actual um, picture in, in states or by country or by, you know, county. Um, but I think everyone is, their experience is, is framed by their, uh, their perception is, is uh, framed by their experience. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I would say that if you looked at my, my town, I might think that there's no, you know, COVID virus. But in fact, that's not true because I know just an hour away in New York City, uh, you know, the morgues were packed and there were trucks uh, 10 feet back uh, housing bodies. I mean, it, it's true. I, I watched it. I saw it. I had colleagues that I connected with that were telling me that people were, were really dying in the hallways. And so I think we have to frame our perception um, using a variety of experiences, not just our supermarket, perhaps, but also understanding the vetted programs or news resources that, that I think are valuable. So it, it's a tough situation, but I think the more you listen to a variety of news outlets from around the world, you get a much better perception than just something locally, um, because it's just a bigger picture and has better data connected to it. Um, that's all I can say. I don't know. I mean, I, I hope right. your supermarket continues to be healthful and, and that you continue to shop there if they're doing a great job and keeping everyone healthy. I think that's wonderful. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Something a bit left field, though, Eddie, before we go, is um, when you see how strong this virus has been, almost unusually so, do you think that there's any credence in the sort of the, the man-made um, allegations that people have made? Um, well, the data that I've reviewed is they've done genetic uh, mapping, and um, it's not man-made. It's, you know, you're asking my opinion, and I'm telling you from the data, um, it's not a man-made uh, virus. It was, it's very likely to have come from the wet markets in China. Um, you know, it's possible that we had a zoonotic exposure from, uh, you know, of course they're looking at a bat here, but, but there is no evidence that it was man-made. Um, and you can edit this out, that's fine. If you don't agree, that's fine. But I, I can't change my opinion based on anything. I, I'm just going with what I know. And, you know, I have to research this for my stuff as well. So 
it was mapped and it's been confirmed by multiple reputable um, scientific bodies that this was not man-made. Okay, I just thought that was. Yeah, and, and look, I, like I said, if we don't agree on things, that's okay. It's your program. I just don't want you to, don't, don't take my words out of context if, if that's okay. No, I'd actually, actually we, we don't, the only thing we edit out are bloopers. Oh, okay. I just, I know Elaine is, is a little bit up. He went, oh, and I, you know, <laughs> the way I see it is, you know, look, we can agree to disagree. That's what well, life is about. Well, that, 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 that's, that's, that's interchange, you know. Unlike, unlike many people, just because we have different uh, opinions, we don't think people are wrong because they're working on their data. That's right. That's right. Their data, their perception, their their life experience. I mean, and, and that's what's been difficult too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, not everyone gets the same education, training, data resources, all of that. You know, mm -hmm. so that's the problem for some things like this. Super job. Is there anything we should have asked you that we didn't? Um, I don't know. I guess one thing I'd want to say is educating younger people has been my goal. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm hoping to get this work into schools nationally, you know, disease yeah. prevention, health, nutrition, mm -hmm. how food matters. Um, you know, I think the adults are great because, you know, they listen mostly, but, it, but young kids and teens mm -hmm. are really ripe for this information and they're going to be the difference um, as we move forward in mm -hmm. terms of chronic health conditions. So, you know, it's just a plug for the work that I'm doing just to, to know mm. I'm doing it. Well, actually, actually, the subject of your book particularly resonates with me. Um, when's it coming out? It's coming, it's supposed to launch September 8th, but it's available for pre-order right now. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, it's a guidebook. And I think um, I want to guide, help guide people, myself and my co-author, who's phenomenal. Um, he was actually, Dr. Frederick Bomsaw was responsible for taking bisphenol A out of baby bottles in 2012. Uh, he's a pretty renowned um, BPA researcher among other chemicals. But, um, but we're working to, to really give people just usable information. You know, mm. I think that's what we're all missing is just what do we do now? What, what, yeah. what can be done yeah. um, without too much fuss and, and money to, to just really make a difference in our health? That's true. Very true. That's everything from my side. Alan, anything else? Uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm done ranting for today. <laughs> I was going to say, I think I need a drink, Alan. I don't know. Uh, you're definitely challenging, to say the least, but very, mm -hmm. very, uh, you know, wonderful interview, but definitely challenging. And you had me on my toes there, so congrats. Uh, okay. Super job. You, 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 you did a great job, too. No, I appreciate it. You guys are great. And um, and look, these are the questions people are asking. So God bless, you know? Yeah. You know, so good for you for posing those questions. I appreciate that. So, but thank you for the opportunity again. And, um, and good luck and stay healthy. I mean, that's all we can do right now, right? Stay healthy and keep doing good work, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for those that believe in that, uh, pray for it. Yes. yes. So, uh, Thank you again, Ellie, for being on the Local Paleo Show. And as we say in Texas, à votre santé, y'all. Okay. Thank you again, guys. Be well.